We've looked at curvilinear motion so far with two different coordinate systems, rectangular x and y coordinates and normal tangential. So today we'll complete this with uh, the third coordinate system, uh, polar coordinates if we're in two dimensions, which uh, become cyl cylindrical coordinates with the addition of z if we're in three dimensions. But since we're mostly working with uh, two-dimensional, we'll just refer to them as polar coordinates here. So we define a, a particle is position by its distance away from the origin and by an angle theta measured from some reference, usually the horizontal, it doesn't have to be. And again we add the z-coordinate normal to this uh, plane that contains uh, theta and r to uh, make that uh, the third, third dimension. So the unit vectors, again in just two dimensions, will define the radial dimension, again along the uh, along the uh, position vector that uh, defines the coordinate just outward from there and normal to that we have the uh, transverse direction given by the uh, theta as the subscript. And so in this case we usually define uh, the motion by changes in the angle, in other words by angular velocity such uh, rotating machinery uh, might have a velocity defined in RPMs rather than by the speed of the particle as we did with normal and tangential components. You'll see that these two a lot of times can be used interchangeably. Sometimes it just depends on what information you have given as to which ones are more convenient to use. So as opposed to working with i and j um, unit vectors, of course these vectors do change with time just like they, uh, they did with the normal and tangential. So when we uh, do the differentiation here, we come up with this expression for velocity r dot. Of course, it's just the uh, rate of change of the radius. And theta dot is the rate of change of the angle, in other words, the angular velocity. And so drawn on our uh, picture here, again, r dot would be outward. r theta dot would be in the transverse direction. So if, this w if r were constant here, we'd be making a circular uh, path and uh, our theta dot would be the same as the velocity uh, of the particles we'll see later. And again, both r and theta are going to be changing. If that's the case, then your path will not be circular, but rather will be a spiral. So as we uh, differentiate that expression, you come up with a little more complicated expression for acceleration. You'll see that there's two terms in the radial direction and two terms in the theta direction. Now again, if r were constant, then of course r double dot in that last two r dot theta dot would be uh, uh, zero in that case. And so what you would have would be equivalent to normal and tangential components. But drawn on here, you, d you can see though that the r theta dot squared, which would be similar to the um, normal uh, component of acceleration, is going to be inward. But since our unit vector r is outward, that's why you see the negative sign uh, on that particular component. Notice there's one other, this 2 r dot theta dot, that's termed as the Coriolis acceleration. So only when the angle and the radius are both changing at the same time do you have uh, Coriolis acceleration. So as we said, most of the problems involve rotating machinery and so again you're getting uh, an angular velocity theta dot and a lot of times that is expressed in RPMs, revolutions per minute. So whenever you have that uh, as the case, make sure that you convert angular velocity such that it's in radians per time and make sure that angular acceleration would be in radians per time squared. Again, usually radians per second and radians per second squared. Otherwise, you're uh, because radians is a dimensionless quantity, if you use degrees or revolutions, then your units won't come out correctly. So just one more comment about the Coriolis acceleration. We said it's only present if the radius is changing and the angle is changing at the same time. So a couple of examples of that. If you've ever walked outward on a merry-go-round, uh, you felt the sideways force, and that force is associated with the Coriolis acceleration. If, again, if you're standing still, such the radius isn't changing, you don't feel that same side, sideways motion. And if you look at a crane, this one's uh, working on the new student center. 
that if this is rotating at the same time that that trolley is moving outward, then there is Coriolis acceleration uh, on that trolley. And so the designers of the crane do have to consider uh, the forces that are associated with that. Okay, well that kind of does it for uh, this kind of um, uh, curvilinear motion. So next time we'll be talking about dependent motion. Uh, you worked some problems like that in statics where you had ropes and pulleys. And so what we mean is that one particle, the motion of one particle is directly dependent on the motion of another particle. And so in this case, instead of looking though at, uh, at the forces, we'll be of course looking at speed and acceleration ratios. And we'll, we'll refer back to statics uh, to see how those two relate.